Hello and welcome to Virtual Penguin Talks, events on the issues which matter most to young people right now, from Penguin, the UK's biggest publisher. Today's theme is intersectionality. I'm Jessica calgren fozard I'm a deaf, disabled and gay YouTuber and activist. And today I'm joined by Mohsin Zaidi, who is a criminal barrister and author who grew up in a strict Muslim household in a deprived area of East London, but went on to be the first in his school to go to Oxford University and as an openly gay LGBTQ plus advocate. Mohsin's just written a memoir, A Dutiful Boy, which we'll be hearing more about later. I should also explain that I am using a sign language interpreter who is standing just here off screen and also thanks to Holly, who is down below signing for us as well. Um, so please forgive me if my responses are a little delayed, it's not a technical fault, unless it is a technical fault, in which case definitely not my fault. <laughs> and thank you again for joining us. Um, if you'd like to send questions for Mohsin and I to answer, please do so by the YouTube comment feed, which will be opening at 20 minutes past two. You'll probably need to refresh the page if you don't see it. But thank you. Um, that's all, Mohsin. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So intersectionality is a very big theme, obviously. What does it mean to you? Well, I guess it's a long word for what is essentially the opportunity to be completely yourself. And when I say completely yourself, I mean harmoniously. So the different parts of your identity uh, don't just coexist, but they complement each other. And so, for example, the fact that I am both um, an ethnic minority and uh, gay, they're not in conflict, um, but they can support one another as parts of me as a whole. That is such a lovely way of looking at it. I feel like that's a very... Um, holistic way. I think often we talk about intersectionality and we're talking about the negatives, the, these two things cross-sect and that makes life more difficult and worse. So it's really lovely to be talking about it in a way that these two things about myself can really be a benefit. For me, growing up as a teenager, being gay was never the big issue for me. It, it was my disabilities, which at the time, no one even knew about, I hadn't yet been diagnosed, and that was the real struggle. So being gay, coming out, having to be the odd one out, who was the only one in my class who was talking about that kind of thing, um, was less of an issue because I had something else that I was dealing with. But growing up, was there any particular intersection of your identity that was harder to deal with? Well, I think, I think at different stages in your life, different parts of your identity um, take centre stage. And so when I was younger, reconciling my faith with my sexuality was the, the biggest struggle and the loneliest because I was too scared to, to talk to anybody about it. Um, so when I was younger, that was the biggest challenge. But then as I began to get older, um, things like the fact that I'd grown up in a council house that weren't relevant when I was a kid suddenly became extremely relevant when I was at university, surrounded by people who had grown up with um, a lot more than I had. Yeah, I can imagine being at Oxford University, which still has a very high rate of people coming from private schools. Was it more the sort of inequalities of having grown up in a very different environment in terms of wealth that really made a much starker contrast than race and religion? Well, I think it, it you know, I think, what, you know, we were talking about earlier, what does intersectionality mean? I, I think it means that actually these things are so um, indecipherable, it, sorry, they're so intrinsically linked to one another that there are examples where, for example, I had friends who um, didn't know my, couldn't remember my name, and they said it's because they'd never been friends with a foreigner before. And, and that's partly a race issue, and it's partly kind of a cultural thing and a religion thing, because my name is a religious name. Um, 
so I wouldn't I couldn't pinpoint one particular part of myself that, that I guess struggled more than others um but it was a really great exercise in I guess finding the different part finding the different parts of me and exploring the different parts of myself and how they coexisted um so that so that I was mature enough to be able to hold them all together. I like to think personally that having struggles has made me a much more determined person and it's given me a lot of strength and energy to kind of move forward and achieve my goals because I'm like, you know, as a child, I really had a lot of difficulty with my body, but it wasn't recognized. And yet I knew that it was there and I was like, I know that I'm right. I know that you're wrong and there is something I'm struggling with. And it really pushed me and it's given me today a very strong drive. Do you feel like being different from the people that you were growing up with because you were gay gave you that amazing drive because you've done some really incredible things? Thank you. Um, I think that there is definitely a pressure when you are different uh, and you're scared of your difference and you're scared of what it will do to your family if people find out about your difference I think it does can make you want to overcompensate um, by working hard at other things um, and I write about this in A Dutiful Boy I write about really putting my head down with schoolwork because I wanted my parents to only see my grades. I didn't want them to ever have to look at any other part of me. Um, but I guess the one thing I wouldn't want people watching this to, to take away is the idea that somehow that's that's right, because actually that's, that's, that's not right. You shouldn't have to overcompensate um, for parts of yourself. You should be able to just be proud of every part of yourself. Completely, and I know that that attitude uh, drove me into the ground a number of times mm. and was really quite dangerous for a while. The idea that I felt I always had to put in twice as much effort as everyone else just so that I would be able to reach that bar. And, and I try and I don't always practice what I preach, but on my YouTube channel, I'm always very, very clear with my followers that you need to be putting yourself first and you need to be looking after yourself and that that's what's more important than whether other people think that you're good enough and you've tried hard enough. Yeah, I, com I, I completely see that. Um, and actually, so much of the time, we assume that the way that people see us is the thing that determines how we should feel about ourselves. But they are two different things. And I think that as you get older, you begin to be able to tell the difference between how people see me and how I see me. Um, whereas when we're younger, we tend to think of them as being one and the same. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. So we've talked a little bit about your book and I am really intrigued as to what made you, what was the moment where you thought, I'm going to write a memoir, I'm going to write about this experience, and I'm going to share it with other people? Well, originally I wrote, uh, I wrote two chapters about coming out to my mum and coming out to my dad uh, for myself, uh, because I wanted to keep a, a record and a memory of... Uh, to what to me were the most formative experiences in my life. And I, I thought that, you know, one day I'd probably get too old to remember all the kind of small things that happened as well as the big act itself. And so it started off as uh, almost a diary entry. And and it, I guess it kind of went from there because I, I then started writing about other things that felt important and allowed me to reflect. Um, but the catalyst was wanting to have a, a memory of something that felt really important. And it's obviously a very personal book. And I think you include in it a moment where uh, you go home and your father has a witch doctor there to cure you um, of homosexuality. Did you have difficult moments whilst writing the book and uh, publishing it where you thought, you know, the sensitivity around including people in the book and maybe they wouldn't, how they would feel yeah, I mean, 
I, I think that's like an ongoing thing where you're worried about how people in the book will react um, by the way that they are perceived. Um, I, I was, it was quite important to me. In fact, it was very important to me that my family were on board the whole time. And so I made a promise to them that they had the right of veto over anything that they felt uh, shouldn't be included. Um, and so they read the book before it went to print se couple, several times. Um, and the other, the other thing to say is, although the, the witch doctor thing did happen and it was important to write about it, um, my dad got over it. But the, but the reason to write about it was to show people just how hard it can be for loved ones to come to terms with something. I think there's a real difficulty as well when we're mixing um, religion and sexuality that it can be very difficult to dissociate the idea of uh, God and religion, and our own personal religion, and our own personal feelings and relationships with whatever religion we may or may not have and then the cultural aspect around that. So I have a lot of friends who've grown up Christian and they didn't get support from their parents and their community when they came out, mm. but they still feel like they have their own very personal relationship with God. But at the same time, dealing with that is has a lot of very conflicting emotions in it. And I think it's really wonderful that we have your book because it's a very shared experience the idea of going against culture and going against your family um but in a very positive way I think it's lovely to have a positive book and lovely to have the positivity of your parents being able to read that book and um and appreciate it thank you yeah I you know I guess it's it was it was scary for me back then and um, in some ways it's still scary now because um, there is a sense of challenging the norm um, but I guess that's how I feel about it is I feel very firmly a part of my community and not um, somebody who's speaking from the outside of it um, and so it's important um, for me that this it, it's clear that this is a, a story of one person's experience um, in the hope that others can see how it feels and, and and hopefully relate to it in some way um yeah the, the idea is more experience rather than theology or anything like that but in going through those experiences um to write them down for the book is there anything that you realized about yourself or something that had happened that you had seen one way at the time but now looking back on it to write it down you learned something new about it Writing about my parents and my, my siblings' experiences with kind of a 10-year, some 15-year gap allowed me to better appreciate what they were actually going through. Um, I think at the time I was, some might say, understandably angry at some of their reactions. But being able to kind of look back and think, OK, what happened and, and why did that person behave that way? Um, I guess it allowed me to empathize with how they were feeling. Um, it allowed me to step out of myself and look at it from somebody else's view. Yeah, our parents always say to us, you know, like, oh, you'll understand when you're a parent one day, you'll understand when you're older, why I've done these things. And it seems so illogical when we're young. And as teenagers, we think, why on earth would you do this? This completely makes no sense. And then we get older and go, oh, Oh, I see. Fine. All right. Yeah. 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 You do. I mean, I, I, it's funny the number of times I find myself saying, oh, they were right about that. <laughs> um, yeah. It's kind of embarrassing, really. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we're all embarrassed by our teenage behavior looking back. <laughs> so, I'm sure that having written the, bo the book, many young people are going to see you as a role model. But did you feel like you had any role models growing up? Well, um, honestly, when I was growing up, I felt quite isolated. Um, I didn't see that many people who I thought 
looked like me or who were going through similar experiences. Um, but as I, as I kind of went to university and, and got older, I've definitely recognized people who I think, okay, that person is a role model. So for example, I can think of like three people, two of them who are historical figures and one person who's alive today. Um, the first is James Baldwin, who's a writer, and he was interviewed once uh, in the 50s. And the interviewer said to him, you were born black, gay and poor. You must have thought, gee, I really got the short straw. And he looked at the interviewer and he said, no, I thought I'd hit the jackpot. Um, and I loved that. The That's other really is um, a woman called Audrey Lord, who is a lesbian writer um, who wrote about the fact that um, an attack on the black community is an attack on the LGBT community. An attack on the LGBT community is an attack on the black community because we are all more than one thing. And as she put it, there is no hierarchy of oppression. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two people who sadly aren't alive anymore. And then the third is Malala Yousafzai, uh, because I think that she has, from such a young age, stood for something so simple and so powerful um, and has been unwavering. So she's a kind of a current role model. So speaking of current role models and current times and the kind of differences from when we were growing up, which I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but I still feel like culture has changed quite dramatically. Um, I have this, I really apologize to my little cousin for telling the story yet again, but my cousin was bringing my, my girlfriend and I were going to visit my cousin for the first time. I was introducing my new girlfriend to the family and my cousin's little daughter, who was, I think at the time about seven, my cousin was prepping her, like, you know, just to let you know, so, Jessica's coming and she's bringing her girlfriend. She's a girl because they're gay. And her little cousin went, oh, no, she is not. And my cousin was like, oh my God, you know, oh, what have I done? How is this seven-year-old not accepting? Oh no. She's like, no, 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 she is gay. She's gay and that's okay, that's okay. And so I was like, oh, mother, she's not gay. She's a lesbian. <laughs> I just thought that was so that is wonderful. Brilliant hearing that back like yes perfect these are the these are the people we need these are the That's children the of today wonderful do you see within your cultures um a difference oh i think we're having some fun technical problems right now oh we're back oh yeah okay we're back um so yeah do you see within your cultures surrounding you a difference in the new generation who are coming up? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I can't, I can't speak for any one kind of cultural movement, but it seems to me as though there is a massive difference bet even between me and um, somebody who's 10 years younger than me. Um, I think that there's been a huge shift in uh, a respect for LGBT rights and an understanding that um, it isn't a choice and that, that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, there's still work to do, of course, um, but I, I hope that with, with the next generation of people, uh, we will see a massive cultural change in attitudes. And that plays out. I mean, when the British um, government do this attitudinal survey where they survey people and they ask them about their opinions on things, and consistently the British people's opinion on LGBT rights is becoming more and more accepting, which is great. Yeah, I believe that nowadays it is only 8% of the UK public who believe that gay marriage should be banned. Well, then they don't need to have one, do they? Like 8%. It's such a, a tiny, tiny minority now. Um, and I think it's beautiful to see how Except it is, and I know I live in Brighton, which likes to claim itself as the gay capital of the UK, and uh, kind of is, kind of is, does own that title. And I do sometimes feel like I live in a little bubble 
because obviously I also work on the internet and I work in spaces that are very gay friendly, that are very disability oriented. And people are always asking, you know, what do I, what can I do for you? What do I need to make this accessible? And then there is still a difference when I'm somewhere else with my wife, when we go and visit my parents in Cornwall, when we, even when we go to London, just the, you suddenly notice people noticing you. Mm. So we walk down the street here in Brighton and like we're the least interesting thing. But if you're walking down the street in Cornwall holding hands, then perhaps it's a little uh, different experience. But I definitely see that young people, you know, 30 and under, not only does it not, is it not a big deal so much, but also that, as you said before, the blending and the intersections coming together and feeling like if you are part of one minority, you need to stand up for other minorities as well. I think it's lovely, but what advice would you give to young people today who were, who are in exactly the same position that you were in at the age of 15? Okay, um, it's difficult because um, I don't claim to, to have all the answers by any means, but um, I'd say three, three things. Uh, one, read as much as you can. Um, so I just mentioned James Baldwin, uh, and I mentioned Audre Lorde. Um, and the reason that I think it's important to read is because um, someone once said, a brilliant book has windows and mirrors. Windows, so you can learn about other people by seeing inside, and mirrors because they reflect your experience. And I think when you're young and perhaps feeling isolated, it's important to find experiences that mirror your own um, and there are so many people that have written about their lives that there will be at least one book if not five or ten um, that will help you reflect on your own experience so I would say reading is a really important part of um, growing up and maturing and, and realizing your self-worth so that's number one number two is give people the, the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think that when you're struggling with your identity, uh, it's, that's one thing. And then it's hard to imagine how other people will react. Um, and sometimes your loved ones might not react in the way that you hope immediately. Um, but if you start off having some difficulty with it, then perhaps it's understandable that they might too, but that doesn't mean they're always gonna feel that way. I think that time and space are a wonderful thing for the purpose of reflection um, and change. But in the meantime, and this is point number three, you should find a community, um, a community of people that are like you, um, that can support you and that can embrace you and love you for exactly who you are. Um, and I think that those are the three pieces of advice that I would give. That was beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing that. So I just want to ask you as well a little bit, and by the way, everyone, uh, if you can't see the comments that are next to this on the YouTube page, just refresh it and you should be able to see the little comments box and you'll be able to type in your questions for us. But I just wanted to ask you a bit about your process of writing. So you are obviously a very busy man working in the law. How did you find time to write a book? Well, I took time off um, because I'm self-employed as a barrister. I would take days where I wasn't in court to um, to write. Um, I also would write most weekends. Um, and when I went on holiday, uh, because my fiance likes to sleep in, I would spend the mornings writing as well. Um, and then I would take some time off just, just to write. Um, but there was a lot of squeezing it in wherever I could find a gap. What was the hardest thing for you to write about? Or was it more difficult to write about a particular experience or the actual act of writing itself? 
The hardest thing to, to write about was my family because it was important to me to show people how hard it was for them, but without making them look like they were villains because they're not villains. Um, they love me and their desire for me to be straight is not out of hate, but out of love. Um, and so the, the most difficult thing to, to do was to strike a balance between showing the reader how hard it was for me, but without portraying them as being nasty because they weren't. Um, and while, while we're just getting Jessica back, I- um, Sorry about that oh. one second. <laughs> Sorry, do continue. Well, oh no, I was actually just uh, filling time because I I said while we get Jessica back, I was going to to the, talk about a book or something. But luckily, you're back now. Oh no, please continue. Give us your book recommendations while we're here. Ah well, um, the, the uh, well the only other book I was going to talk about that I'm reading at the moment is the Booker Prize winner, Girl, Woman, Other, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, it's so rich with uh, a diversity of stories um, and experiences and so um, yeah that was that was going to be the thing that I reached for because I wasn't sure if you were coming back but you're back which is great <laughs> and we got a book recommendation so that went very very smoothly uh, again people uh, just to remind people if you can't see the little comments just refresh because of course we would love to hear from you and we'd love to know more do we feel like there's another book in you? Yes, but definitely not about me. I'm kind of sick of writing about myself, <laughs> sick of reading. The one thing that nobody tells you is that it's almost more important than the writing process is the editing process. And so I have now read my book about a million times and I am so sick of myself. So yes, I would love to write another book and I'm actually kind of working on ideas at the moment, but it will be fiction and certainly not uh, autobiographical. I'm actually incredibly impressed um, at anyone who can write a memoir. I've tried to kind of write down some of my feelings and experiences from the most difficult parts of my teenage years when I was very, very ill and struggling a lot. And I just found that the emotions were still very overwhelming. Do you think that, are you at a place where it's now bad experiences are almost a scar rather than they're still slightly healing wounds and that that was what helped you be able to write about them or did the process of writing about them in some way heal them? So I guess I, um, I, I probably the best way for me to respond to this is by referring to one of the last things I say in the book. Um, so I think it's the final chapter of A Dutiful Boy where I'm talking about the different parts. Um, and the Japanese have um, a tradition, I think it's called Kintsugi, although I please apologize for the pronunciation, um, whereby you have, let's say you have a, a bowl and it's, uh, I've made it, it's a ceramic bowl. And if it breaks into different parts, um, it's then broken. But what the Japanese do is they will glue it back together with um, gold, resin with gold glue and then the new bowl is then this beautiful new thing which has these lines that are all uh, kind of laced throughout it um, and when you look at it you can see that it was once broken uh, but now the the thing that originally ruined it is the thing that makes it beautiful again and probably more beautiful than it was before and so for me, I prefer not to refer to those experiences as scars. Um, and the way I write about it in A Dutiful Boy is to say that we're all born whole. And then because of history and societal expectations, we're quickly broken. And the, the work of our lives is to put those things back together again. Um, but I think that the work of doing that and then looking back and seeing that it's done is a beautiful thing. That is such a lovely place uh, for us to end our talk. Thank you. That's really lovely. Um, let's take some audience questions.
So the very first question is for both of us, and have we ever faced internalized homophobia and how to stay positive and not listen to hate? Do you want me to go first? Oh, yeah, you go first. Um, yes, uh, there was plenty of internalized homophobia. Um, I, I'm, I write about it and I'm ashamed of it now, but I think that it, just because it's internalized doesn't mean that's where it started. And so it's easy to blame ourselves, but you've got to remember that, that you know, as I said before, you weren't born with homophobia and nobody is. So, so yes, there was plenty. Um, in terms of coping with it, I think it's important to, as I said, find a community. Um, and I guess it's important to think critically, self-critically about some of the things that you're saying or some of the ways that you're reacting to things um, so that you can identify it. Because I think the biggest battle is being able to recognize that it's internal homophobia. Um, and once you can do that, the rest will be fine. I think it's an interesting point about being able to recognize it. Um, because I wouldn't say that there were moments that I can point at and say, yes, that's definitely caused by internalized homophobia. But there are certainly things that I struggled with that now looking back on, I could say were maybe to do with that. So for instance, as a small child, I kind of knew that I had these feelings about girls and I just sort of assumed everyone else did. And you know, that's what they were talking about. And they were like, yeah, we're best friends. I'm like, yeah, we're really best friends. It's great. And then, and then had a kind of realization that that hasn't, wasn't actually what everyone else was talking about. And when I was like, yeah, boys, they're fine. That's all right. <laughs> I was like, oh, that must mean I, that's fancying, right? That's when you're like, yeah, he can sit next to me. Okay. And then, oh no, right. People have, okay, different feelings, Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really struggled with not being what I saw as that very stereotyped lesbian. So I only had a very few things that I could look at and say, oh, there's a lesbian in that movie or there's a lesbian in this book. And they were all very stereotypically, you know, short hair. Um, it was the noughties that so they wore cargo pants because that's what they did. And I went through about six months of being like, oh God, do I have to do this too? I mean, look at me. I'm not a cargo pants kind of girl, but I tried <laughs> hard for six months and, uh, and it kind of tore me up. And I thought, no, this isn't at all what I want to be. I feel like I'm forcing myself to become something more than, because my family were very accepting. I wasn't forcing myself to be straight, but I was forcing myself to be someone else's idea of what I should be as a lesbian. So for me, the biggest revelation was that I could be myself and still be gay. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you make a really good point because um, some people will want to have their hair short and some people won't. And there is no such thing as, uh, Oh, that's what a gay person looks like, or that's what a lesbian looks like. Um, and so I think it's important to anybody listening to know that, um, you know, maybe you will want to cut your hair and maybe then you'll grow it out. And, um, yeah. and all of those things are fine, but it's more important that you're doing what feels right to you and not harming anyone else, of course, um, than to, to, to prescribe to any rules. Mm, definitely. I think it was it was great to find out that there weren't hard and fast rules about being a lesbian. You have to tick <laughs> these boxes, or else you just couldn't be one. It wasn't allowed. It would be probably quite a lot easier some of the time, though, right? <laughs> if there were. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you just say, "Oh yeah, I'm the lesbian box. I'm good. We're done. <laughs> no hard work or anything." Yeah, it's it's been a lovely thing growing up to realise that you don't have to do what anyone else tells you and you can still be yourself. Yeah. You can accept everything about you. All right, our next question is, how can we increase LGBTQ plus representation within schools? For example, as part of what's studied or discussed in class. So I obviously can't speak for what is currently on the school's program. I don't know much about it, but I do know that when I was in school, we did not, talk about anything gay 
or anything on any sort of LGBTQ plus spectrum at all. And everything that I learned was from out of school, from books, from terrible TV shows that definitely didn't tell me anything true. Um, and really just from having to figure it out myself. So what would you like to see on school curriculum? Well, I, sh I should start by just echoing what you said. When I was growing up, um, there wasn't any um, movement towards making the curriculum more representative. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, we learned almost every year about Hitler and the Nazis. And not once did anybody tell me that um, Hitler made LGBT people wear a pink triangle and he persecuted them and sent them to concentration camps. And I think it's appalling that, it, that we learn about World War II over and over and over again, and yet we're not told this. Um, and I think that it, it goes to show that there is a problem, or at least there was when, when I was at school. Um, but another, another example is the Ku Klux Klan. We learn about how racist they are uh, and were we don't learn about how homophobic they are and were. Um, and so I think if, if, if it were me, and I know that the question addresses how we increase LGBTQ plus representation, but for me, what I would like to see is the Department of Education, so the government department, um, to do an overhaul on, to, and, and for it to diversify education from start to finish. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think that we do need to learn more about Britain's colonial past uh, in a way that isn't just about how wonderful it is because actually it was it was awful some of the things that the British Empire did and I don't think we learn about that um, I don't think that we learn a balanced view or, on for example Winston Churchill um, and so I think that um, there should be a, an initiative whereby we diversify the curriculum and we look at it not just from the LGBTQ plus perspective but from uh, learning more about heroic women and learning more about empire and about ethnic minorities who have helped change and shape the world. I agree. I think it's important that we don't have sort of the rainbow class that's just slotted in and once a month you go and you sit down and your teacher tells you about LGBTQ plus stuff, but rather that we're learning within all of our classes, the sort of, but also, so it's like, here's Churchill, he did this thing, wonderful. He helped secure battles, victories, but also... Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, that would be lovely. But like, as an example, um, Alan Turing is, was a mathematician. Um, and so you could learn about him in history, but you could also learn about him in computer science because the Turing machine, his machine, was arguably one of the first models of a computer. Um, and as part of that, you should be told that Alan Turing was gay and was, was prosecuted for homosexual acts um, uh, and, you know, didn't, didn't have a great time because of his sexuality. Because I think it's important to learn it as an integrated piece, as you say, not just an additional, oh, and here's the LGBT uh, class. Yeah, I think it's sort of a tragedy of the LGBTQ plus culture is a culture that we don't pass down to our children. Completely. That if your parents are French, they teach you about French life and French food and French culture, and then you can pass that down to your own children. But if your parents are gay, are they necessarily passing down gay culture to, are their children gay? Are their grandchildren gay? And then we don't necessarily, as gay people, look up to the older people within our, um, within our culture and learn from them and learn our own history. So it would be lovely to have it in schools to be talked about in that sort of rounded way. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that's funnily enough, that's exactly what I write about in A Dutiful Boy. Um, and I make reference to, to, to the Nazis. Um, and I, I, I do it from uh, writing that story when I met an older gay guy who was, you know, 10 years older than me when I was 21. And he took me under his wing and really just helped me to accept um, myself for who I was. And, and so that was our version of learning our culture. You know, he would took, take me to bars when I was too scared to go inside by myself and teach me about the Nazis. And so, I, yeah, I, I think that's really important. 
Our next question is, do you feel that coming out is still something you should do? Or do you think that in today's society, it doesn't need to be announced as such? I think you should do what feels right to you. Um, so I think if you if you feel like you want to come out and you want to announce it in some way, um, then you should. And I think that if you don't want to have to have the coming out experience, um, then don't. I mean, I think it, you. I think it's really important that people do what feels right to them and not feel pressured to follow any model. Of course, it would be great to live in a society where there was no such thing as having to come out. Um, yeah. I don't, unfortunately, think we're there yet. So I always say that I don't have a coming out story because I never came out to my parents. Um, I was brought up with Quaker parents who were very much like, you know, whatever you end up being, darling, is absolutely fine. And whoever you end up marrying, blah, blah, blah. And there was never the expectation that I would find a husband. So then when I started, you know, plastering my walls with pictures of girls that I rather fancied, and had very close relationships with my female friends and absolutely no interest in boys. My parents weren't in the least surprised. So I've never, to this day, and I'm married, I've never sat my parents down and gone, um, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> I've just, yeah, never told them <laughs> because I didn't ever have to. But having said that, although I say I have no coming out story, I think that when you're gay, you come out every single day. All the time, every new person you meet, you have to come out to them. Every time I go to the hospital and someone says, oh, is your husband coming too? And I'm like, it's my wife, yeah. And they're like, oh, you're married. You know, where did you meet your husband? Well, my wife and I met. <laughs> and it's just over and over and over again. Or, you know, someone comes in, they're like, hello, are you Claudia? Like, no, I'm her wife, I'm Jessica, <laughs> you too. Um, so I think that although we can say, yes, there should never be that thing where we have to stand up and announce to everyone that we're gay, it wouldn't remove the fact that we still have to, every single day, in very small ways, come out. Yeah, um, yeah, completely. Um, I do think, you know, we were talking about culture earlier, and I, I do think it's changing. And so now people are more likely to ask about a partner rather than a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Mm. Um, I'm still surprised when somebody asks me you know, about my wife. I'm just like, oh, I thought everybody knew now. So it kind of takes me off guard. Um, but yeah, hopefully it will get to a point where it just won't be a thing. Oh, our next question is incredibly interesting. And I feel like you'll have a very good answer for this. What do you both of you think is the most interesting event or person in LGBT history? Wow. The big question. Event or person in LGBT history? Well, I mean, I think I'm on the board of Stonewall and it would be kind of bizarre of me not to refer to the Stonewall riots. Now, they took place obviously in America, uh, but they did spark a global movement um, for change uh, and for equality. And so I think it would be it, it, it wouldn't be right to, to answer the question without referring to, to the Stonewall riots. I, I quite agree. I think it'd be remiss if one of us didn't talk about it. Um, for me, I feel a little torn by this because I sort of want to say, um, you, know, you know, when gay marriage was legalised in the UK, but that's such a small, tiny piece of LGBTQ plus history and I say that because it affects me and I, it actually became legal the same year that I met my wife and we got engaged very quickly and it was wonderful that we could, that we had the chance to do that, we had the ability, but it's such a sliver of our history and it affects a tiny minority of us because there are still so many people around the world who aren't able to have that sort of marriage equality, who aren't able to have many equalities that we experience in the West. And I, I hope that the most important event in LGBTQ plus history is yet to come. 
I think that's lovely. Um, and I think it's really right and important that, that we do remember how much more work there is to do. And I guess that that's part of our history is that it has been um, incremental and there haven't been necessarily loads of big splashes of events happening. But, you know, just the everyday act of coming out is part of our history. Um, and so there are there is the stone there is the stonewall riots, but there are things that happened hundreds of years ago that are relevant, and there are things that uh, like the marriage act that you, you mentioned that are also relevant. Um, and I, yeah, you're right. I mean, the sad fact is that in the majority of the world, it's still criminalized. Um, so, in terms of a global fight for our brothers and sisters, there's way more to do. All right, we've run slightly over time because I'm so enjoying this conversation. Um, but we're just going to squeeze in one last question, which is, there's a lot in the news right now about discrimination and hate. How can we all stay positive and celebrate our differences and similarities as people? Well, I think that it's important to educate um, yourself. Um, and so it, there are you know, even if you are from a diverse background, that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand completely what somebody else is going through. So for example, um, I had to educate myself on feminism. And after educating myself on feminism, I am now a card carrying feminist. And uh, I think it's really important that you can feel like you're an advocate for people, who, even if you're not in the same kind of bracket or group as them. Um, so, so for me, the best thing you can do is educate yourself and become an ally confident enough to speak without worrying about whether what you're going to say is wrong because you've done the homework. Um, for me, I actually just made a video about accessibility and pride and how pride celebrations themselves can often exclude a lot of people with disabilities. And I think one happy outcome of pride this year and it's so sad that so many parades and so on have had to be cancelled, but it does mean that we are able to come together more online and that actually we're able to make our celebrations more accessible. So I would like to see um, more accessibility and more joining together within the community, which I hope is really going to be brought forward this year. And unfortunately, we are now going to have to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us and for telling us all about the book, which I believe is coming out on the 20th of August. Yes, yes. I will hold up a little picture. I mean, this oh, is lovely. Thank you. Cover. Um, but it is available to pre-order now, I believe. Yes. From the thank you so much for having me. Just going to boost you. It's great. And I can't wait to read it. And thank you so much as well to Holly, who's been joining us down below, signing. Thank you, Holly. And thank you to Ruthann, who's here with me. Thank you very much. And just to let you know, for those of you completing the activity sheet, the colour of today's talk is citrine. Go for that. Citrine is the kind of orangey colour. Well done. Um, if you would like to see more from me, you can follow me on YouTube under my full name, Jessica Calvin fozard or on Instagram at Jessica Out of the Closet. Make sure you subscribe as well to Penguin Platform, the channel that we are currently on for book talk and giveaways around all of Penguin's teen and young adult books. And please also do fill in the short feedback survey, which you can find linked in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation just as much as I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>